Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We'll live for you We'll live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could live and save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We'll live for you We'll live for you we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We'll live for you We'll live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Hello, church. It's great to greet you this day. Um, This is our last week before we transition into our live services again. Um, So, Lord willing, uh, we'll see you next week uh, in a different format. Uh, We'll be going live at uh, 10 a.m. on Sundays. But for this last week, uh, as we were doing, putting up the teaching on Saturdays and still... Uh, getting together on Zoom. So, last one of the series. It actually is the last of the Olivet Discourse, uh, Jesus' message from the Mount of Olives to his disciples, the last part before we go into the last timing that leads to his cross and leads uh, to the resurrection and his ascension. So, we're in those last days. We're getting almost to the end of Matthew. I'm excited really enjoyed teaching through this book, and I hope you've enjoyed it too. And more than that, I hope it's been um, just something that has put your eyes on Jesus and, and how you're living for Him. So, so today I have kind of a strange question, and then we'll pray. And the question is, are you a sheep or are you a goat? And you're like, Pastor? <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm either one. Well, I hopefully we'll see whether we're a sheep or a goat today as we look at Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. So let's pray. Lord, we just come before you now. We thank you that your word is clear. Your word is life and it shows us who we are. And Lord, I just pray that as we look at this passage as... Uh, Hebrews 4 tells us that your word would be that sharp, two-edged sword that would divide the bone and the marrow and and would look at the intentions and our hearts and, and, and Lord, that there would be nothing hidden from you and that we'd see ourselves. Help us to know who we are, Lord. And more, more than that, Lord, help us to serve you with all our hearts, Lord. And I ask this in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. This is that last one of the parables uh, that we've been teaching through. We looked at the, the parable of the talents uh, last week. Uh, and we're going to have to give accounts to Jesus. And now this week we look at whether we're a uh, sheep or a goat. Sheep or goats. So, let's see. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He who will sit on the throne of His glory. 
and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, we look at this and think, okay, well, sheep, I I know that one. You know, the good shepherd, uh, Psalm 23, Jesus is my shepherd. Uh, I hear his voice. So I understand that one, you know. I I guess I want to be a sheep. That's my goal, to be a sheep. But where, where do the goats come in? And, and uh, you know, how, how does that work? Well, in the, in the Old Testament times, when the shepherds went out, they would bring together the sheep and the, 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 the goats and take them out to pasture. And they were kind of all mixed together. Uh, but when they got back at the end and would, would separate them, they would separate them out because the sheep were so much more valuable than the goats. So and we hear the, pa- the passages about the th- thief breaking in and the shepherd, you know, watching out for the thieves and the, the robbers. And they were guarding the sheep because the sheep were valuable. The goats were there, and, and they were, but they weren't as valid. Somebody stole a goat now and then. I guess it wouldn't be that big of a problem. But the sheep were uh, because of their wool, and they were, they were just uh, part, very important to the shepherd. So we see that, that bringing together and also the, the end of separation. And it brings to mind, to me, the, the parable we saw that Jesus preached on the wheat and the tares. Talking about uh, that there was planted good wheat, but then an enemy came and planted tares. And then when it started growing up, the servant said, there's, there's tares among the wheat. What do we do? Do we tear it out? He said, no, we don't want to pull out the wheat. So we'll wait till it grows up. And when it's time for the crop... We will separate the wheat from the tares, and the wheat will go for, well, for, for producing bread and everything else will be for profit, and um, the tares will be burnt up. So we see that, that, that idea, and it, and it brings a little bit to mind here about the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, uh, the, 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 the one that has profit and is, has, uh, is close to the master's heart, and the one that was just... This, in the end, is going to come to destruction. So we kind of keep that in mind as we look at that. But we think, and how does the separation happen? Because it's important. I don't even know if I'm a sheep or a goat. So how does that she- separation come to be? Well, look at what verse 34 says. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And, and the people are going, Jesus? <laughs> when? When did we do this? Uh, the righteous answer him in verse 37, Lord, uh, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? We don't understand it. We don't, I think we would have remembered. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So, okay, you did it for them and you did it for me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food, and I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they also will react as, When? Then you will also answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and do not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteousness with the righteous into eternal life. Now we might listen to this and think, well, well wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor, are, are we looking at... Uh, are we talking about salvation through works? Are we talking about being saved by works? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's right. We're, that's not what we're supposed to do. No, no, no. Wait. We're not talking about salvation by works. We're talking about practical servanthood. You see, Ephesians 2.10, if you turn there with me, Ephesians 2, sorry, 2.4, Ephesians 2.4 says, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together 
with Christ, by Christ, by grace you have been saved. So if you look at that, the only way we get salvation is because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He was crucified for us. He bore our sins on himself and he paid the price. For grace we have been saved. We've been raised up together and made to sit up to, uh, together in heavenly places in Christ. We were raised with him. We were crucified with him. Our sins were crucified with Jesus, and now we're raised with him and seated in heavenly places in, G in Christ Jesus. Then in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, it repeats it, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. There it is, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, many times we kind of stop there. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's not of works, it's by faith. It's by faith in Jesus, and it's true. By, by, uh, by understanding what he did for us in the cross, he died for us, he paid for our sins, uh, he took all our sins and the sins of mankind upon himself, and he was the only perfect sacrifice who could pay the price. And we are crucified with him. We live a new life because of what he did. By grace we have been saved. But look at what verse 10 says. For we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, we, we come to Jesus and, and we accept the, the gift of life he gives us. We become that new creature. And then our purpose in life is revealed. We are his workmanship. He created us. He is our creator. He, we are his poem. That word is poema. We are his poem, his work of art that he created, that he paid for on the cross. And we're created for a purpose, and that purpose is good works. And he prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, it's not a salvation by works. It's because we are saved. We want to do the works of Christ. We want to do and live for him day after day. It's that, that, that coming out and bubbling out from the fountains of Christ, the, the love that comes out, the grace as we receive from him. Many times I've given you the example of vertical relationship. We have the vertical relationship with Christ. We receive from him because of salvation, because of what he did on the cross. We have access to him and we receive his love, his joy, his mercy, his peace. He, he, he changes our life. And because he does that, we are to be those, those channels of blessing to others. We are to love others and, and give mercy and peace and help others out for those good works because of what the love that we receive from him. So our, our vertical relationship with Christ becomes our horizontal relationship with the world. So this affects this. And the problem we see here is when this is not affected by this, there's something wrong in this conduit, the flowing of, this, of, of God's love out to those who surround us. That's why James in James chapter 2, verse 14, it says, What is it profit, my brethren, when someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one says to them, Oh, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what is it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Something is stopping up the flow of love. Faith without works is dead. But, so, but someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. It is that example. That I, I do the things I do because what Christ did for me. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. <laughs> it's not enough. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Once again, faith without works is dead. So you see, what we're talking about here is not a salvation by works. We're talking about what it looks like. But I think also as we look at this specific parable, we need to dig a little deeper. We need to dig a little deeper and see because this is the last parable of his Olivet Discord, which talks about the end times. 
And, and we, we began to see, and we're talking about judgment that's coming and Christ returning home, uh, returning for us to take us home. We need to see and, and get a little more clarity when this specific judgment is happening. We can learn a lot about the judgment itself, and we'll look at that at the end, but we want to look a little bit more in the timeline to understand what is happening here. If you remember in the last weeks as we've been looking at this whole series of the Olivet Discourse and Jesus' return, talking about you know, uh, uh, making accounts with Jesus, talking about His coming back, talking about being ready for the return of Jesus. We went time and time again to the passage in Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Daniel 9.24 it gives us a summary of what is going to happen in these 70 weeks. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, for your people, the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem. And what is going to happen in these 70 weeks for Jerusalem and for the Jews? It says, to finish transgressions to make an end to sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. And we looked at those three, that first part, were accomplished with that first part of this prophecy as the Messiah comes, as the, the, well, before as the, as the city is rebuilt, the temple is rebuilt, the Messiah comes. And we saw that as we looked at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The king is here, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the king came triumphantly into Jerusalem and said right after that he's going to be cut off and he's sacrificed. He was crucified on the cross and on the cross he made an end to transgression. He made an end to sins. He reconciled. He paid the price for iniquity. On the cross Jesus fulfills those first three parts of Daniel's 70 weeks. But there is the second part because there is that one week left. If we look at the first part, 69 weeks, there is that one week left. That, when is that fulfilled? And between that time and the last week, this time of the, the Gentiles begins, the time of the church, when the church is to bring the message of Jesus, to share the message of Jesus with the world. But when the church is taken away and we looked at the rapture and we looked at the time, then, the, then that last time will begin, the time of the tribulation. And then the Great Tribulation, we looked at that also in the last weeks. This time of the Great Tribulation at the end when Jesus comes back to judge the earth, then we will see Him bring an everlasting revelation. He will seal the vision and the prophecy, to finish fulfilling all the prophecies and the visions, and He will be anointed as Most High, to anoint the Most High. He will receive the kingdom, and it will be this everlasting kingdom you see, that's what we're looking here in um, the book of Daniel, but we're also looking here in this Olivet Discourse. Jesus is talking about those end times when these last three, everlasting righteousness, vision and prophecy, and the anointing of the Most High to bring in the kingdom is going to happen. So then it's, that's why it says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and His holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. This is what will happen when He comes back. So in order to get a, a better picture of that, we need to go and look in another passage in Daniel, another prophecy in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 talks about this time when he comes, the, 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 the king, the Messiah, the, the, the long-awaited one comes. And it says, verse 9, I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, his hair of his head was pure, like pure wool, and his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, fiery, uh, fiery stream issued, and it came forth before him. A thousands of a thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand, ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated, and it says, the books were open, and that is judgment. The books were open. It was time to make accounts. And I watched because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain. His body was destroyed and given to the burning flame and talking about that judgment of the beast. And the rest of the beast, they had their minion taken away. Their lives were prolonged for a season and the time. There's a, there, so, so the beast was defeated, but there was 
a pro, their life was prolonged, the rest of the beasts, their life was prolonged for a season and a time. We'll look at that in a minute. I was watching in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man, coming up with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. It is kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And we see here Jesus receiving the kingdom and bringing justice. Now, in order to get a little more few details about this, we need to go to the book of Revelation. To see this, the picture we just saw in Daniel chapter 7, now we look at it in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Remember, the beast was bound, the serpent was bound for a thousand years for a time. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousands of years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. You see, we're talking about the millennium. The, when, when Jesus will come to reign on this earth, before this earth passes away, after the, the tribulation, we see that the period of the millennium where Jesus will come to reign. And Satan will be bound. And then we see thrones. I saw thrones. They sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received his mark on their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousands of years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, one of the things to, to keep in mind, to reign over who? Who will they reign over? They're going to reign, but they're going to reign over who? And if we think this is still the earth, and we, we've had, you know, a third of the earth destroyed here, a third of the earth destroyed there. If we look at Revelation, there's a lot of destruction going on. But how many billions of people do we have on earth today? So at the end of this great tribulation, this tribulation time is as Jesus comes back to reign, he's going to reign for a thousand years over this land, over this earth. And those who are left on this earth will be, uh, the, the, the saints will reign over them. And we'll see uh, what life is like when Jesus reigns over this earth, we see the heart of man is still the same. Because after this time, a thousand years are over, um, then Satan will be released from his prison, verse 7. And he will go to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. The nations will grow. And Satan will go deceive him, and Gog and Magog will gather them together to battle, those whose number is the sand of the sea. So they will rise up against Jesus, rise up against the saints. And they went up to the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, once again, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And there they would be tormented day and night forever. Eternity. This is the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ, reigning over the people who are left after the great tribulation. And after those times when, when we see... <laughs> And this is the question, if, if God were in charge, everything would be perfect. We would just do His will. I think this is in a sense, and I question many times why the millennium. Some people can't understand the millennium and they say, well, this must all be figurative. And, and for many years they said, oh no, well, the millennium is now and we're bringing it in and the church will get to a point where we'll bring in the millennium and, and technically they don't believe in a millennium, it's all figurative. But they say, we're bringing it in. And if, I, if that's the case, I look around me as like, I don't really like this millennium. But no, we see here a literal thousand year reign of Christ. And in this thousand year reign of Christ, we see him 
separating. We see him bringing judgment. This is probably where this sheep and goat separation, if we look at the Olivet Discord, this is the very last one, the last one after the tribulation time when we'll bring to make accounts. He, he brings up this, this last discourse talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats, those who were, if we see, you did these things for the least of my brethren. That's another clue right there. You see, during this last seven years, this last week that Jesus was referring to, when the rapture comes, when we are taken up as a church, will people still be able to get saved? That's a good question. I'm sure at that time there will be many here who have never prayed a prayer, who have never uh, come and, and surrendered themselves to, the, to Jesus and, and, and given their lives to Him. And that moment when the rapture happens, they will be aware. We've been left behind. There's a whole series of books and some movies on being left behind. What happens then? So yes, there will be people who will be left behind, who will be here, who will recognize that they were left behind and at that time will, will come to Jesus, but they will have to go through the tribulation and the great tribulation and, and many, if not most of them, will end up as martyrs. And at that time, we also will have the Jewish people coming to Jesus and, and, and seeing him who they, they crucified and, and, and in a sense having that revival amongst themselves and as they come to him and the revival happens at that halfway mark in this seven years, the Antichrist comes in and stops the sacrifice in the temple and puts himself there and we see um, and we looked at that. When the abomination of desolation comes, then you know, run, for there will be three and a half years where the people of the Lord will be persecuted, killed. So there will be a great persecution among, uh, among no, to, towards the Jews at that time, especially the Jews who are not following the Antichrist. And we see there in Revelation, it talks about he will hide them away, he will protect them, but at the same time, there will be a great many of them will be put to death. So the people around here, during that tribulation time, the question is, what did they do for my brethren? Did they care for them? Did they, did they uh, protect them? Did they hide them? Did they feed them? Whether it be Christians or whether it be Jews, and here at the very end, when Jesus comes back in triumph, defeats in the Battle of Armageddon, defeats uh, Satan and his minions, and we see the, 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 the beast being killed, and then we see Satan being bound, then Jesus will come to reign. And I believe that's when this separation happens. So the people that are left on earth, how did you treat my brethren? How did you treat my people? And he will separate the sheep from the goats. Not a question of salvation there. They still have to make a choice, those who are saved. And we'll look at that in, in just a second. But it's a question of how do you treat my people? How do you treat my brethren? And it'll be a time of separation because of their works and what they did and what they didn't do. And then the, the, the saints will reign for a thousand years over them. And we see at the end of those thousand years, when Satan comes back, we'll see those who maybe turned and, and, and were loyal to, to Jesus and had that conversion, but we'll see that many, it's just like a multitude, many will follow Satan and come against the Messiah, come against Jesus, come against the saints, and then there will be that final destruction where Satan is sent to the lake of fire for eternity, forever and ever. We see that there at the beginning of Revelation chapter 20. They were cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever, eternity. Many concepts in the Bible, when we look at them, people, oh, I don't like that concept. 
you know, forever. So, so we come up with doctrines and ideas. Well, maybe forever isn't forever. Maybe after a while, God will just kind of poop and they're gone and destroy them. Just because we don't like it or doesn't feel that that's something that we would do doesn't mean that it's not true. Forever means forever. Eternity separated from God because of their choices, the choice that they made in this life. Every choice we make has a consequence. Look at what it says in the next verse. Verse 11, Revelation 20, 11, said, I saw a great white throne. This is a different, different judgment, a great white throne, and him who sat on it, for those, uh, from those who uh, faced the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Everybody was judged in this great white throne. And I saw the dead, the small, the great, standing before God, and the books were open. Now this is a judgment of everyone, not only of that time, but of all times, all the dead. And the books were opened, once again, judgment time. And another book was open, which is a book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. <laughs> according to our works. Remember, we don't get to heaven by our works. So that's not the way to get to heaven. By the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death, and Hades delivered the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and those who did not follow were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here is uh, the way we knew if this person was going to live forever with Christ or be separated forever in the lake of fire. It says, verse 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life. These are mine. I paid for them on the cross. I came to die for them and gave my life for them. Thomas Akempis said this, To many, the saying, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, seems hard. But it would be much harder to hear the final word, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Those who hear the word of the cross and follow it willingly now need not fear what they will hear of eternal damnation on the day of judgment. The sign of the cross will be in the heavens when the Lord comes to judge. Then all the servants of the cross, those who during life made themselves one with the crucified, accepted Jesus as their Savior, will draw near with great trust to Christ the judge. Why then do you fear to take up the cross when the thought of it can win you a kingdom? In the cross is salvation. In the cross is life. In the cross is protection from enemies. In the cross is the infusion of heavenly sweetness. In the cross is the strength of mind. In the cross is the joy of the spirit. In the cross is the highest virtue. In the cross is the perfect holiness. There is no salvation or hope of everlasting life but in the cross. So we look at this parable, and yes, there is a, in, in a sense, a, a completion. This is talking about the judgment right before the millennial kingdom as, as the sheep and the goats are separated. Which are the ones that followed me, that took care, that did these works, and, and, and the saints are going to reign over them for a thousand years. This is that judgment because this, this is not the judgment we're looking at, the great white throne at the end of the millennium, where the only way they will be judged is not what they did, not their works, but they will be judged by whether or not they knew Jesus and gave their lives for him and walked with him. And we saw Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So the good works are there, but it's not the salvation by works. You see, we need to understand, yes, this parable of the sheep and the goats is about that time, but it also has great truth for your life and mine. As we look once again in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, we are his poem, his poem, his work of art created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
We need to be living for Christ. We need to be doing the works He called us to do because we want to be ready for the time that He comes. We want to be here when He comes and calls us to be in His presence and are taken away in, in the rapture and with Him in the blink of an eye, we're with Christ. And we know there will be those who will not make that choice and in and, and that time the great tribulation might come to Him and because they were left behind, make the choice and they will have to, to suffer the consequences of that, but still they will be in the presence of Christ when he comes back to judge this earth. You see, I think the important thing to do, look at today is judgment. Judgment is coming. And I'm not like one of those people standing in the street corners with this bread basket thing, bread thing thing, the end is coming, repent. But it's the same message. Because people look at them, oh, they're, they're weird, they're, 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 uh, they're not uh, all right in the head. And, and hopefully one day, because you thought all those things, because you thought, oh, I have more time, you'll miss the call. You'll miss the trumpet. It will just be too late. We talked about it in the, the lamps. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. No oil. Or when Jesus comes back and will say, give me accounts of your life. Well, I, I hid mine. I, I, I really, you gave me talents. You gave, but I didn't do anything with it. Depart from me to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth like a fire. Or now one more time, how did you live this out practically? What did you do? I, cr I created you for good works. I prepared them beforehand. Did you walk in the good works I, 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 I gave for you, the things around you? I put people around you. You have a circle of influence, people around you day after day after day. Did you show them me? Did you show them my love, my mercy, my peace? Or is somehow this, this, this flow blocked by self. You see, Revelation 22, 12 says this, Behold, I am coming quickly. That's Jesus. My reward is with me. He's going to judge. He's going to reward, but he's going to judge first. And to give everyone according to their work. Oh, but it's not by works. No, it's not by works. But have we been a sheep or a goat? Do we really know Jesus? Do we, have we really come to the cross and live for Him? Because if we have, there, there, there should be, you know, we are His workmanship created for good works, and if we come to Him, there should be something to show. My reward is with me to give everyone according to their work, to His work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do, once again, do, do His commandments. Obey his word, that they may have the right to the tree of life, may enter the city, uh, the gates of the city, go into heaven, be in his presence. Outside are the dogs. Oh, okay, I'm not a dog. Sorcerers. And we see uh, sorcery or witchcraft is like the sin of rebellion. And, and the Bible puts those two together, re rebellion. Sexual immorality, murderer. And Jesus said, if you hate your brother, it's like you murdered him idolaters, and we could go a whole sermon on that. Uh, an idol is not just a, 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 something made of wood or gold. It's, it's something that takes the place of the Lord. Or the last one. And, and I found this one very interesting. Whoever loves and practices a lie. Are you living a lie? Oh, I'm a great Christian. I'm doing this. But what's inside of you? Are you like those Pharisees that Jesus said, you know, look all good on the outside, but inside they're, they're like whitewashed tombs. They're full of dead bones and dead things. Are you living a lie and loving it? Do you really have a relationship with Jesus? Do you know him? Are you full of dead things inside? Dead bones. Are you loving and practicing a lie? Jesus says here, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. I've sent this message to you. I've given you this message to the churches, 
to those who are listening. I'm giving you this message. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I'm everything you need. Are you living a lie? Have you taken the life? Do you realize what I did for you on the cross? Do you realize that, that the life that you live now is going to affect your eternity forever? The Spirit says to the bride, the church, come. Come. Here it is. Come. Let him who hears it, let us who hear it say, come. Yes, I want to come. Let him who thirsts, I have a thirst to, to get to know Lord, the Lord more, to do and live for him. Let him come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Come. Here it is. It's free. Come have life. I want you to live. Be one of my sheep who know my voice, who know me, who follow me. Don't be a goat who just kind of hides in the middle of the flock. Come, take the life I have for you. I want us to uh, go over this parable again. And I, I want to do this because um, there's a song by one of my uh, favorite uh, piano players, singer, Christian contemporary. Uh, his name is Keith Green. He's with the Lord now. He's, he's in heaven with him now. But Keith Green wrote this song uh, about the sheep and the goats, specifically this parable. And basically it's a retelling of the parable, he, but he does it in a very unique way. And I think as we, we look at this idea again and go back and review, and how am I living my life? What am I doing? Am I living a lie? How, how do I live my life for Jesus? We're not worried about the eschatology and where this falls in and, and, and this is the Jews or this is this, this is that. But, but really the example that Jesus is giving here, am I a sheep or a goat? I know salvation is through Jesus alone, through the cross, but am I living as a sheep or a goat? Am I living a lie? Am I kind of hiding in the sheep fold? But I'm really a goat and the shepherd knows it. I look at, around me, I see all these sheep around me, so I must be a sheep too, but I, I have these horns. And then at night, the shepherd separates me because I'm not as valuable as I'm just kind of there. But one day, like the wheat and the tares, the end is going to come and the separation is going to be that final separation. And we'll be separated forever in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Am I a sheep or am I a goat? You see, the time will come when Jesus will make that judgment. And now we have a time, a chance to become that sheep, to do the things, to first of all come to Christ and to live for Him. But secondly, to do those works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want to give you an example. Did it? Look at this at first, but here's a, grabbing a cable here. Look at this cable. And just imagine this cable goes on forever. And I, Francis Chan did this example. I thought it was very good. Um, imagine this part at the beginning where you plug it in is your life on earth. This is where you were born. Uh, this is, you know, became a teenager here, and well, you lived here, got married. This is your life right here. But this cord represents eternity, and this cord goes on and on and on and on and on forever. So here you are now, somewhere in here, turned uh, 53 yesterday, so I may be over here at this end. Hopefully not too near that end. Well, if it means to be with my Savior, so much the better. But we're somewhere around here. The decisions that you make here affect your eternity. In this short little bit of time that the Lord has given you here on earth, the decision you make here will affect your eternity with Him or separated from Him. You see, are you a sheep or are you a goat? in that sense. Have you listened to the voice of your shepherd and you follow him 
The shepherd knows who the sheep are. Or are you a goat kind of hiding among the sheep? Thinking, I'm just a good person and, and I'm, you know, I'm okay. Uh, I do my own thing. I don't hurt anybody. But the decision you make here, like Thomas Akempis said, I don't like the word denying myself, you know, taking my cross, following me. You know, it's, it's kind of, that's a, sometimes a hard thing for us. Deny myself, take up my cross, follow Jesus. Well, can I do it on Sundays? Maybe part time. Can I, can I follow Jesus every once in a while? You know, like when it, there's like, I don't know, when I'm bored or, or when I have nothing else to do or maybe all well, Sundays. I'll give the Lord Sundays. See, it says those words will be much easier to hear than depart from me. You cursed into everlasting, everlasting fire. You see, the decisions we make here affect everything else. Are we living and loving a lie? Hear the words from the song from Keith Green. And if you haven't heard it, I recommend you hear it because with piano and the way he puts it, it's so much better. But here's my version. And when the Son of Man comes and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on his glorious throne. And he would divide the nations before him as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he shall put on the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he shall say to the sheep, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom I prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was sick, I was in prison, and you came to me. Thank you. Enter into your rest. And they shall say to him, and answer him, and they'll say, Lord, when? When, when were you hungry, Lord, and we gave you something to eat? When, Lord, when were you thirsty? I can't remember. And, and we gave you to drink. Uh, when were you naked, Lord, and we clothed you? Uh, Lord, when were you a stranger and we invited you in? I mean, we invited a lot of people in, Lord, but I could never forget that face. And Lord, when were we sick and we visited you or in prison and came to you? Lord, tell us. And as much as you did for the least of my brethren, you've done it for me. Oh yes, if as much as you've done it for the least of my brethren, you've done it for me. Enter into your rest. Then he will turn to the goats to his left. Depart from me, you cursed ones, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked out in the cold, in exposure, and you sent me away. I was a stranger and I knocked on your door, but you didn't open. You told me to go away. I was sick, racked in pain upon my bed. I begged and prayed and pleaded that you'd come, but you didn't. I was in prison and I rotted there. I prayed that you'd come. I heard your programs on the radio. I read your magazines, but you never came. Depart from me. Lord, there must be some mistake. When? Lord, I mean, when were you hungry and we didn't give you something to eat? And Lord, when were you thirsty and we didn't give you something to drink? I mean, that's not fair. Well, um, would you like something now? Uh, would one of the angels like to go out and get the Lord a hamburger and, and a Coke? Um, uh, you're not hungry. Yeah, yeah. I lost my appetite too. Uh, Lord, when were you naked? I mean, Lord, that's not fair either, Lord. We don't know what size you wear. Oh, Lord, when were you a stranger, Lord? Lord, you weren't one of those creepy people who used to come to our door, were you? Oh, Lord, that wasn't our ministry. We just didn't feel led, uh, you, you know, Lord? Lord, when were you sick? Uh, what did you have anyway? Well, at least it wasn't fatal. Oh, it was? I'm sorry, Lord, I would have sent you a card. Lord, just one last thing we want to know. Lord, when were you in prison? What were you in for anyway? I had a friend in Leavenworth. Enough! Inasmuch as you've not done it for the least of my brethren, you've not done it unto me. Inasmuch as you've not done it for the least of my brethren, you've not done it unto me. Depart from me. And these shall go away into everlasting fire, but the righteous 
into eternal life. And my friends, the only difference between the sheep and the goats, according to this scripture, is what they did and didn't do. What have you done? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you taken the gift of salvation and are, are you now living for Him? Or are you living a lie? You said, oh, I prayed a prayer once and yeah, I go to church. I'm in with the sheep, you know. But you're really a goat. Are you ready for His return? Do you know that you know that you know that you have Jesus in your heart? We looked at the parable of the lamps. Do you have oil in your lamp? We looked at the parable of giving accounts. So you, what have you done with the talents the Lord has given you? The, the time, your, 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 your resources, your life. What have you done for the Lord? And practically, are you a sheep or are you a goat? Can you say what Revelation 22, 20 says? Surely I am coming quickly, amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Will you be ready? Do you say, come, Lord Jesus? I'm ready for your return. Come. We want to be in your presence. We want to see you. Or are you, oh, I hope he doesn't come now. I got my life to live. I got to do my things. I got this. I got plans. I got this. I... What will you do? Remember, eternity is a very long time. And no matter how much we try to beautify, oh, we'll just pff, disappear, we're not in charge of that choice. We can't twist our theology to make us feel a little better. You see, judgment is coming, and eternity is long. And the question that we have to answer is, Will we be ready? Do we know Jesus? And does he know us? My prayer is that you haven't been living a lie and loving it, but you've been living for him with all your heart, your soul, your spirit, your mind, everything. Living for Jesus each and every day. Let's pray today as we come and uh, end the service and may the Lord just speak to your heart right now. May you know that you know that you know that you know him. And by doing that, may you be ready and do the works that you were created to do. You are his workmanship. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Go and do them. Live for him. And every time you see a person sick or needy or hungry, remember this. You did it for the least of these, my brethren. When you did it for them, you did it for me. We're doing it for Jesus. We're living for Jesus. May we see the world that way. Lord, we just come before you now. And Lord, we ask that you, just like we, in Revelation, Lord, that you would anoint our eyes with eye salve. That may we see, Lord, may we see the reality of this parable. May we see the reality of your love for us. And Lord, what it means to live for you, not only have faith, but also to do the works which you prepared for us. And Lord, when we go and help and, 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 and talk and, and just minister to the people around us, may we see you, Lord. And realize, Lord, that every face, every need, we're doing it for you. But more, more than that, Lord, we're doing it because of you. Thank you, Lord, for the life you give us. Lord, may we live for you every day. And we pray this in the holy name of Jesus, the only name that brings salvation. And Lord, may we be those conduits of life to others. Pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church is a blessing. Um, live for him. If I could do one thing as a pastor, and I look at this next year, the one thing I can do is just keep pointing you to him. 
that would be enough. But he has a lot of other things for me to do. So, um, but the main thing, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Serve him, live for him, be ready. He's coming back. May we all be able to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Your bride awaits. Amen.